Half of Pennsylvania's legislative races had no choice on the ballot in November 2016's general election. Frustrated voters began to ask why. In early 2017, thousands of people turned out for meetings about gerrymandering, wanting to understand what's gone wrong in our Pennsylvania elections. This episode was filmed at one of the earliest public meetings of Fair Districts PA at a large high school in Montgomery County. Chair and co-founder Carol Cunningham explained the history of gerrymandering and why it seems our votes don't matter. There's a section that refers to our previous congressional districts. Those were changed after a lawsuit in 2018, but will be drawn again in 2021 after the national census. This is the second of a six-part series provided by Fair Districts PA, a nonpartisan coalition of organizations and individuals working to ensure fair districts and fair elections for all Pennsylvanians. Fair Districts PA is a fiscal project of the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania. This project is funded in part by the League of Women Voters Citizen Education Fund as part of the People Powered Fair Maps Initiative. There's three words you need to understand really well to grapple with this topic, and we're gonna start with a little bit of vocabulary. Some of this you learned in civics class a long time ago. I don't think I ever learned this in civics class, and I paid attention pretty well, but I don't think I learned this. So the first word is reapportionment, and people think, why does gerrymandering happen? Well, the first thing you need to understand is reapportionment. So every 10 years, there's a national census where the Census Bureau counts the people of our country, and then based on that, they reassign where the congressional district seats are. So by law, there are 435 seats in the House of Representatives, and those have to be divided out across the country by population. So if one state gains in, one, in population and another state loses in population, that state that gains will pick up a seat or two, and the state that loses will lose a seat or two. Historically, Pennsylvania has been losing at one, least one seat every decade. Our population has been stagnant compared to some other states, and at this point, the latest statistics show that Pennsylvania is actually losing population. We're shrinking. So we will lose at least one seat in the next census, and it's possible that we will lose two seats. So reapportionment happens by law every 10 years. Some states gain, some states lose. Pennsylvania will lose. So the next thing that triggers is redistricting. As you lose or gain seats, you have to redraw the district lines within the state to keep those districts in the state relatively even. And there are rules about how close the population needs to be. And there are rules about how the district lines are drawn. So in Pennsylvania, the congressional districts are done as a bill. So someplace in Washington, D.C., there are some very smart map makers who are tweaking the maps, trying to figure out how to eke out as many seats, congressional seats, for their party as they can. And then they hand that map to our state legislature, and it's just passed as a straightforward bill. The state legislative districts are done differently. They're done by a five-person committee, so majority and minority leader in House and Senate. Each are able to appoint one person. And then those four are supposed to agree on a fifth who will be the chair of their committee. Normally they don't agree, and then the state Supreme Court chooses the fifth person. So basically you have three, it's, supposed, it's a committee of five, but three will agree on what the next maps for the state, house, and senate districts will be. There's three people um, kind of drawing the lines for the next 10 years. Now there is some wording in our state constitution that says the districts must be geographically compact and contiguous, and unless absolutely necessary, no county, city, incorporated town, borough, township, or ward shall be divided in forming either a senatorial or representative district. You live in Montgomery County, you know that that is not followed very closely at all. So the timeline for this, um, the next census day will be April 1st, 2020, and then there's a process where the census takes place, the numbers are given to the president, he gives the numbers to the house, there's a process of reapportioning the seats, and then the data is given to the states by April 1st of 2021, and then each state has its own time frame for when the district boundaries need to be in place, but they all need to be done by the next general election in 2022. Which brings us to our third word, which is gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is the manipulation of those electoral maps for political advantage. And it's a conflict of interest embedded in the way that our democracy works. It's a conflict of interest that threatens the integrity of our elections. Now the word comes from this guy, Eldridge Jerry, who was the governor of Massachusetts back in the early 1800s. He approved a map that had very strange lines, which is that 
map you see there. And somebody in one of the local papers said it looked like a salamander, which is where the word gerrymander comes from. They combined his name with the salamander, and ever since then we have had gerrymandering. Now, how, how does gerrymandering work? This is a chart that you may have seen. It's a pretty popular one. And basically, it shows that if you have a certain number of units, you can divide those units in different ways for different results. So we see 60% blue, 40% red. If you divide those one way, you can end up with a very fair outcome. Three blue, two red. If you divide them another way, the blues can capture the whole thing. Pretty smart, right? They can draw the lines, and you can end up with five blue districts and zero red districts. Or if the reds are the ones that are drawing the maps, they can do some pretty tricky stuff, and they can capture a majority even though they are the actual minority. That's gerrymandering in a nutshell. Now, I have a problem with the way that's presented, and my problem is it assumes that gerrymandering is only about parties. It's only about red versus blue, Democrat versus Republican, and I believe that it impacts people, and that people are the foundation of our democracy, and people's voices ought to be heard. And the truth is we're not all red and blue, and actually I keep thinking I'm gonna go back and redo it because we're not all the same color red or the same color blue. Some people are very, very deep red, and some are kind of pink, and some are very, very deep blue, and some are kind of a baby blue. And then we have people like myself. I am an unaffiliated voter, um, and I believe that I'm purple, because that's kind of both. Um, and we have Green Party people. We have other minority, um, minor party people. Um, in the typical grid, they don't even count. They're not even there. But the truth is, there are such people out here. And if you drew the lines one way, who would you be appealing to? when you have your election. You would be appealing to the center, right? You would be appealing to the people who might not be aligned with either party. You would be appealing to the most moderate in both parties. You would be trying to put together a majority representative of the people in your district. So if you can draw the lines in a way that pushes the race towards the center, towards something more moderate, towards something more collaborative, towards something more inclusive. You can draw the lines to do that. Or you can draw, this is called a sweetheart gerrymander. Historically, gerrymanders have been used by both parties to guarantee their incumbent safety. So if you're the, the red candidate in that red district on the top, You've got it made. You don't ever have to worry about a blue candidate coming after you. They don't stand a chance. And if you're a blue candidate in the bottom, you have it made. You're safe. Nobody's coming after you. And the only place you have a competitive election is right in the middle. And you in Montgomery County could be in the middle, but they keep trying to draw you more and more carefully to make sure that you don't get that voice. People like making up names for forms of gerrymandering. So cracking is one. Cracking is when you take a population and you break it out as much as you can so that that population doesn't have a voice. If you look at a lot of our little urban cities around Pennsylvania, you'll see them cracked. You'll see them broken out into the districts around them so that they have no voice. Packing is when you take population and you try to jam it as much as possible into one district. And you'll see that too around our larger cities. Um, they loop out to try to grab the people that they want to make vote with the city so that they can keep the districts around that safer for the opposite party. But I go back to the key question, which is in gerrymandering, it's not which party gets the most seats, but it's whose vote counts whose voices are discounted, and really what values are rewarded. Because in this current system, the values that are rewarded are not moderation, not collaboration, not problem solving, but extremism. As you draw those safe districts, you push the elections to the extreme. So Pennsylvania, Congressional District 7. This is normally quoted as one of the top most gerrymandered districts in the country. And it's been given the name of Goofy Kicking Donald, which actually, can you see that? Somebody just recently came out with this other one, Bullwinkle, and I really like the Bullwinkle one. Um, but either way, it's not really the shape that's the problem. The shape is a symptom, but it's, the shape is not the problem. So District 7 snakes from Montgomery County, through Delaware County, through parts of Chester County, out into Lancaster County, and ends up in Berks County. So there's District 7, but that also, look at District 6. District 6 does almost the same thing, but in reverse. And then look at District 16. 16 to me is a real crime, because look at the top little corner of District 16. See Redding? So if you know anything about Redding, you know that Redding in 2010 was the poorest urban community in the country. The census found it as the poorest urban community 
in the country. The most recent statistics show that Reading has the most underfunded school district in the country. And I would say they're underfunded because they don't have anybody looking out for them in the places where budgets are made. They stand on their own. There's nobody advocating for them. You can look at that and you can say, if you were, if you were the congressman for District 16, who would you be thinking about? You're not thinking about Reading. Now in Montgomery County, you are in a way the poster child for divided communities. By number, you should have one congressional district. A congressional district is about 700,000 people and you have 799,000 people. Your county should have one congressional district and your congressman should be thinking about nothing but you. Instead, you have five congressional districts and I promise you, <laughs> your congressmen are not thinking about you. And the same is true with your state senators. You should have three state senators. I believe you have six. Again, you're divided up with the, the areas around you, and you are, you are not the top of the list for your state senators. And then you have that weirdness going on with your house districts. So one of the things that we're really encouraging local groups to do is know your maps and know the stories behind your maps. So you're the ones who know. When you look at those weird things, going on there, like that purple, purple thing. What is happening with it drooping down there? There's a story there. There's a community there. There's somebody that's being packed in a way or cracked in a way. There's somebody losing representation and that map tells a story. And your job is to know that story so well, when you go and sit down with your legislator, you can say, look at this map. Look at this. Are you telling me that this is fair, that this is right, that this is the way it ought to be done? Now, people will say gerrymandering's been around for a long time, but it's changed. Something has changed. If you look at this, in the last 60 years, it's gone from being fairly compact to being something completely, completely outrageous. And what is it that's changed? Well, number one, mapping technology. Think about nobody 20 years ago had mapping technology on their smartphones. Our map, mapping technology has exploded. We can do all kinds of things with maps that people never thought of being able to do. We also have data mining technology, which is able to tell all kinds of things, like how you voted, how you spend your money, what your education is. Um, all of that information is pulled together and is made available to the people who are drawing these maps. So they know block by block how that block voted, how many people on that block voted, when those people vote, do they vote in every election or every other election? All of that information is available, and I promise you, all that information is used. So that the ability to draw district lines has become surgically precise. This is a graphic from a piece of software called Maptitude, which has been used in many states. And, and this particular graphic shows section by section what the margin of victory was for the different parties and how many registered voters turned out to vote. All of that information is available. All of that information is used. This should never be allowed in drawing maps, and that's what's changed. The third thing that's changed is huge, and that's the infusion of undisclosed money following the Citizens United decision in 2010. In 2010, Karl Rove said, he who controls redistricting can control Congress. So basically what he was saying was, if you can control state legislative races, if you can put money into those state legislative races, and win House seats and state Senate seats, then when the state legislature goes to vote on the maps for Congress, you can make sure that your map is the map that wins. So basically what happened was the decision by the Republican Party to do something they called Red Map 2010. This is all available online. None of this is top secret. I was kind of stunned when I began to discover this. All available online, what they decided to do was to, to take national money, and put it into select states, targeting select races in order to capture the state legislature, in order to capture more congressional seats. It's math, it works. Um, and if you look at their website, they announce their success here in Pennsylvania. They talk about spending a million dollars on Pennsylvania house races, which tend to be not very expensive races, winning three of the toughest races in the state, capturing control of our state legislature, and in doing so, they were able to eke out more congressional seats from Pennsylvania. We have 18, currently 18 congressional seats. We're slightly more Democratic than Republican, if you look at registered voters. You would think it would be nine and nine seats. Instead, it's 13 Republican seats 
and five Democratic seats. And that's all because they were able to capture control of the process through capturing control of our state legislature. Now that happened in 2010. We know that this will happen on a much grander scale in 2020. So the Republicans already announced their plan to set aside $125 million to target state races. That's four times what they spent last time. And they won't be alone next time. They got ahead of the game last time. The Democrats will be right there with them in the next round. Advantage 2020 was announced in 2015. Do you notice that graphic? So Pennsylvania is the top of the list, again, um, in, this, in this effort to flip the map from red to blue, and there will be a lot of money that will be spent. But the Democrats, th that was the first thing in that they announced. Then they announced Unrig the Map, which is an attempt to capture governor seats in order to make sure that they have the veto power on, on bills that have to do with the map. And then President Obama and Eric Holder have announced that they too will be working on this issue. Will they be working on this issue to fix it so that it's fair to everybody? Or will they be working on it to flip it so that the blues take control against the reds? Um, we don't know what will happen in Pennsylvania. We know that they've, they've, they've talked about reform. We also know they've talked about flipping states. We also know what they've talked about lawsuits. We don't know where their interest or their dollars will go in Pennsylvania. And I want to, I would be really clear, Fair Districts PA is a nonpartisan organization. We believe that neither party should control the process. And we believe that both parties have been guilty. Um, in Maryland, in Illinois, I'm part of the League of Women Voters. There are League people in those states working hard for reform against Democrats. In our state and many other states, there are people working hard for reform against Republicans. Both parties, when they're able, are very happy to capture the process and very happy to use it to their own advantage. And what I'm saying to you is this will not get better unless it gets fixed. There will be more and more money flowing into our state to capture our legislature. Now, why are we such a top target, which you can see we are if you look at the websites for these groups. You can say, see, we're a top target. And I would say there's three, at least three reasons. One is we are one of the states that always needs to be redrawn. We're losing seats every time. So that puts us on the map um, for this. Another reason, though, is we are one of the last remaining large swing states. There are really only three large swing states left, Florida, Illinois, and Pennsylvania. And then the third reason is that we have terrible campaign finance laws. So any outside money that's looking for good impact, Pennsylvania is the place to come. We have, we have very little disclosure. We have very few limits. We have uh, no gift bans of any kind. I was talking to somebody who was explaining that a legislator had his roof redone to the tune of $15,000. And when asked about it, said, well, why would that be a problem? If you have money to spend on capturing Congress, Pennsylvania is your best place to go by far. And why would people want to capture Congress? Well, think about it. If you could control reg the regulatory process, if you were an extractive industry, don't you want to be the one who gets to decide what the rules are? If you have an international trade company, don't you want to be the one who gets to decide what the trade rules will be? So think of all the places that international business wants to set the rules that's the money that comes into places like Pennsylvania to capture our prog process. So it's not money that's at all interested in the well-being of people in Pennsylvania. It's not money that's interested in our legislators. It's money that's looking for ways to control what happens in Congress, and we become pawns in that game. And our legislators become pawns in that game, too. The truth is most of our legislators really don't like the way it's done. So the impact on legislators is pretty negative. They become targets of attack ads when that money comes flowing in. It goes into very targeted um, market research to find what's the one thing we could say about this person that if we drop a bunch of slick mailers four weeks before the election, we can change everybody's mind. If we release too soon, too close to the election, they won't have any opportunity to, to speak back against it. So that happened to some of our legislators, and it will happen to many, many more if we don't change this. And our legislators know this. Um, they also have a great fear of being primaried 
by extremists in their own party. If the only election in your district is the primary, then you are at great risk if you don't do what your leadership tells you to do. Very much used to keep legislators in control. They're told how to vote, they're told what bills will move and what bills will not move, um, and the leadership keeps control by threatening to primary those, those who don't do what they're told, or by threatening to X them off the map. In other words, in the next redistricting, they can just draw the lines and draw them out of their own district. So many legislators find it really frustrating. They find the process difficult. They went, many of them went into the office thinking that they could put forward good solutions for the people of Pennsylvania, and then they discover it's not possible. I've spoken with legislators who say it was the most frustrating thing that ever happened. I just talked recently to somebody who was not returned to office and said, actually, I have my life back, and that was the most frustrating thing I ever did. The impact on the political parties is not good. It's pushed them to the extremes. If, if the only real election, as I said, is in the primary, then the, the parties move towards the extremes, and it makes it more and more difficult to get anything done. Legislations become more and more gridlocked. And what happens is people are leaving the parties. In states that have open primaries, Many have become independent. The, the number, I keep going back to check this because I have trouble believing it, but nationally, the average, 42% of American voters are now registered independent. That's an amazing number. If I was a party leader, I would be losing sleep over that at night, but apparently they haven't noticed or are not caring a great deal. I mean, Pennsylvania, that number is not 42%. It's about 13%. And there's a reason. The only elections in many of our districts are in the primary, and if you're a registered independent, you don't get to vote. So the impact on the voters, we have less and less choice. In the primary, 86% of our primaries did not have any opposition. 48.7% of our general election races had no opposition. So you have very, very little choice. And the voters feel like legislators don't listen to them. Um, and the truth is, legislators really are often unable to listen to their voters. They're listening to the party leadership, and the party leadership is taking instruction from the people who gave them the money from outside of the state. There's a group called the Electoral Integrity Project, and right before Christmas, they came out with a really important study. It's a group that was started a number of years ago to study elections in developing democracies. So the idea was, if you have a country that's never had elections, how do you know if their election is a free and fair election? So they developed 40 different indicators to show if an, if an election was a, was a legitimate election. And a couple of years ago, they said, you know, we've worked really hard to develop these indicators, and they seem to be working very well. What would happen if we used these indicators and assessed existing democracies? So they began to do that. And the results have been, in some places, wonderful, and in other places, rather frightening. Um, the US is one of those places where the results have been rather frightening. So the headline right before Christmas was, why it's not about election fraud, it's much worse. And they said, I'm gonna read this, I don't usually read these things, but the issue of gerrymandered district boundaries regarded by experts as the worst aspect of US voting procedures ensures that representatives are returned time and again based on mobilizing the party faithful without having to appeal more broadly to constituents across the aisle, thus exacerbating the bitter partisanship which plagues American politics. So they did a ranking, and in their ranking, they gave the US a score of 56 out of 100. Not a good score. And they ranked states. We were well below average in a country that is really struggling with the integrity of its elections. That arrow is pointing towards uh, the number 11. Our electoral district boundary process was given an 11 out of 100. There were only two states that they considered worse and only by a few points, and those were Wisconsin and North Carolina. Both of them have been embroiled in lawsuits since 2011. So Pennsylvania's district boundaries mathematically are among the worst really in the world not just in the country. In most countries, the district boundaries are drawn by independent commissions. They're not, legislators are not allowed to draw their own boundaries. The US is an outlier in that, which is why it, it's considered a great threat to the integrity of our elections. There's another piece to this, which is the fact that it operates as an incumbent protection, I call it an incumbent protection racket. If the boundaries are drawn to protect a particular party or to protect particular people, it shuts out new voices, it shuts out new faces, and as a result, we have poor representation by women and minorities. So the US has been dropping 
in its ranking in terms of women in legislative office, and Pennsylvania is 40th in the country for women in legislative office. So again, we're way below, we're way below, our country is way below, and we are way below that. What are the topics that, that you do wake up thinking about in the morning, and see how they're connected? Because until we fix our gridlocked legislature, we're gonna have a hard time fixing other things. I've talked to a lot of legislators since I started doing this. One thing that I find encouraging is to meet people who really believe in democracy and want to see it work. And there are legislators in Harrisburg who do, who are good people on both sides, both sides of the aisle, who believe in democracy and who want to see it work. There's great frustration in this. There's a lot of work. Um, you need patience. You need persistence. When you go to meet with legislators, you need to be able to hear them and then come back with the next thing and then go back again. Find out what their questions are, go research the questions, and go back again. This is not an easy thing, as I've been told many, many times. I've been told it's impossible, and then I've been told it's a heavy lift. It's a heavy lift. But as Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. And we're going to get this done. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Want to help change this? Sign the petition to end gerrymandering.